Welcome to the Biotech Startups Podcast by Exceda. Join us as we speak with first-time founders, serial entrepreneurs, and experienced investors about the challenges and triumphs of running a biotech startup, from pre-seed to IPO, with your host, John Chi. In our last episode, we spoke with Kitu Kalori about his early years, his experience immigrating to the US, and his time working at Silicon Graphics. If you missed it, be sure to go back and give part one a listen. We continue our conversation in part two, diving into Kitu's time as co-founder of Healthion slash WebMD, his transition to Neo Terrace, and his pivot into venture capital. You've left Silicon Graphics and now you're at Healthion and you're some of the earliest employees here. What was the Healthion like original mission and focus and what was the, the culture like then? The mission was grand, as very noble. It was literally written up on the back of an envelope or the back of a napkin of connecting up providers, payers, patients into one system and using the internet to disrupt that whole uh, healthcare ecosystem. And we were initially targeting the administrative expenses within the healthcare industry, which account for about 15% of the total spend. We were naive about how much we could actually get done because I go back to, you know, not knowing what we don't know. So there's a lot of hubris in the company. We were fortunate that we raised a billion dollars after we went public from Janus Ventures. Without that, I don't think we'd have survived as a business. That allowed us to weather the storm of the internet bubble bursting and the ensuing nuclear winter of sorts. I'm not sure I would say that I was terribly excited by the culture we had built at uh, Healthy on WebMD. I'll be very honest with you. I think there was a lot of I before the we. It was also around the time when it was almost too easy to make a quick buck you know, we got started in 1996. We went public in 1999. And that was timing, totally timing. In fact, we wanted to go back, pub, go public in 98, in the fall of 98. And the stock market had gone through a small crash. And our bankers at that time, Margaret Stanley and Gordon said, you know, I don't think it's good for us to go public at this time. And they pulled out, we pulled out of the uh, IPO. And the data was depressing. 80% of companies that pull out of their IPO don't ever go back. And so we thought we wouldn't go back. There was massive depression inside the company. Fortunately, the window opened again and we went out public in 99 and the rest is history. But I don't think there was as much customer focus, as much focus on creating value for the customer as I would have liked it to be, you know? And so, no, I don't think uh, our culture there was, there was a lot to be desired, let's put it that way. And, and, I'll say I take responsibility for that too, because I was one of the leaders of the company. And so I learned from that. And when we started Neo Terrace, I tried to bring about a culture within the company that all of us could be proud of. And and that and I I I honestly really appreciate the honesty. Um, you know. It's it's you know talking about kind of a, a kind of a learning lesson like that. It's like 
you know, you have to admit that like, Hey, I got it wrong this time. Um, and it's important to like, and I love that you like, we're going to try this again, but we're going to do it better. And I think, you know, also something that you said about, you know, not knowing what you don't know, is like, it's like, that is something like, if you haven't experienced like what a kind of a suboptimal culture and like kind of a, kind of a inefficient one or one that just doesn't gel, you don't know, like you, you got to know, you know, the good and the bad in order to create something that, that you can be proud of. Um, and you're taught. And fortunately for us at Neo Terrace, the first five of us were all uh, healthy on alumni. Healthy on. And so, in fact, I remember having a conversation. The five of us got together at some bar in Santa Clara and we talked about okay, what do we want Neo Terrace to look like? It was then called Dana Street, but we talked about what did we want that to look like and what was important to us, both at an individual level and at a collective level. And everyone voiced their opinion. And we, we, we actually had a bit of a, it was a cathartic experience to talk about what we didn't like about the Healthy on WebMD experience. And that gave us at least the foundation upon which we could build on as to what not to do. Yep. The, the I love hearing that. And and I think sometimes, you know, for for early founders who are contemplating company building, um, it almost it, they can almost like think that the culture will figure itself out. Um, when exactly what you're describing is something that I Prescribe to as well about it's it's an actual concerted effort where you're having this frank conversation of what we didn't what you don't like and what you do like and what do you prioritize and what you deprioritize it's not just like you know something that just like you don't really stumble into good culture it's something that is by design and like intentional um and then when we moved into our second office we were about you know 25 30 people and I remember calling our then director of HR and say, hey, here are the people I think are like the 13 to 15 opinion leaders in the company. And I want you to go interview all of them, including me, as to what is important to us. And then let's get into a room and let's co-write, co-author our culture statement. And we did that. And that became our blueprint for the Neo Terrace way. Fast forward to 2003, I was asked to interview a product manager candidate. And she'd been through nine other interviews before she was put in front of me. And she starts to talk to me about the Neo Terrace culture. And by this time, we were like about 200 people in the company or, may, or maybe even more. And she starts to lecture me on the neo terrorist culture. So I was like, Vashali, how do you know all of this? She says, all of the nine people I talked to, this is all they would talk about. Man, I tell you, I was so happy when I heard that. Because I was like, you know, I did my job as a leader. I, I I couldn't like agree more. Like hearing that, like hearing it basically pitched back to you, you're like, I like I was part of like the engineering of that. And you telling me the story and telling me what you guys stand for, this is amazing. It's surreal probably too. <laughs> yeah, like, totally sorry. And that's why I keep saying, you know, leadership is about influence. Management is about control. Leadership is about change. Management is about efficiency. Those are not the same thing. But influence is way more powerful than control. And so as a leader, learn how to influence. And I just posted something on LinkedIn, but I talked about, you know, inspiration and motivation. You, know, you as a leader cannot motivate your employees. 
the only person who can motivate an employee is that employee. What you can do, however, is you can create an environment to inspire the person to motivate himself or herself. That's your job as a leader. Completely agree. And the like, I think, there, the, you know, the you, it's kind of that saying of like, you can lead a horse to water, um, but you can't get the, the horse to drink. And ultimately it is, you know, in this, you know, carrying over the metaphor, it is that individual's choice to, to do, to say yes or no. <laughs> um, and you can't force it upon anyone. Um, and I, I think that's critically important for anyone who's leading an organization, irrespective of size. Like it is incredibly important to understand that. Um, and, you know, as you were wrapping up your time at Healthy On and, and you're, you're kind of like laying out the kind of like the timeline of things, um, could you like for, for those who, you know, who didn't feel the cycle like, like you did, what was the energy kind of running up to 2000? Was there like similarities to what we experienced, you know, what, what we're kind of experiencing now with AI and what, you know, what was kind of seen in like the 2000s, 2000 or 2021 and 2020? Yeah, I think the 90s, it started with this thing around Y2K and then, you know, it just became a, a euphoria and a frenzy, right? Uh, and and the, the internet and the World Wide Web just took off. You know, this is Web 1.0, right? And it was a phenomenon to behold. I mean, I remember there was this trend amongst a lot of engineers and they called it diversification. They would go work at a company for a year, jump ship work for another company for a year and they'd collect their options because that was their way of playing the market. But, you know, IPOs were going up the wazoo. Companies had no business being a public company started becoming because you know it's all about top line revenue growth. Nobody Sounds cared familiar. about profitability. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Nobody cared about. It. In fact, I remember uh, there were companies and leaders of companies that said, "Hey, if we are profitable anytime soon, shoot us." Because that means we're not investing in marketing, in customer acquisition. Oh my God. That, that is crazy. I mean, you go back and look at Amazon's financial statements. They were not even profitable for a long period of time. Long, long, long period of time. But that was the culture. And then come fall of 2000, middle of 2000, early 2000, there was already started and there was indications of trouble in the horizon. But by the mid, middle of 2000, shit hit the fan and just bottom fell out. Of course, what was interesting about that was it affected the tech sector more. Kind of like what happened to the stock market last year. You know, last year's downturn actually reminds me of the 2000-2001 downturn. Because it affected the tech sector more because tech valuations were indefensible. Like they were last year. I mean... Companies that are growing top line at 20% year over year were valued at 40 times top line. You have no business being valued that much, right? And so when cost of capital start to go up, there was your day of reckoning. And so that's basically what happened in 2002 where suddenly people woke up and said, okay, these fundamentals uh, don't work. But if you look at the influx of capital into venture, it was staggering. 
as early as I think 1986, there was probably single digit billion into venture capital. And by the time we got to like 1999, I would say there was well over 100 billion in venture capital. Funds, more than $100 billion was raised by venture capital funds. It was, it was silly. And of course, then we dropped down to, I want to say, you know, low to mid teens, getting to like 11, 12, 13 billion after the bubble crashed. And we were in that period of funk for a while. And so it was in the middle of that storm that we started Neoteris in our infinite wisdom. That's what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask, like, I was like, you, the, the t- you, you went from, you like, you perfectly timed the healthy on like timing be- right before the bubble. And then you decided to found another company right after everything kind of just went haywire. What was your experience? Like, yeah, actually, even that was a bit of a accident. So I left uh, Healthy on WebMD at the end of 2000, right around Thanksgiving. I remember I attended my good friend Panos's wedding, and that was my last day. And then I decided I was going to take about a year off. And all talk, uh, I ended up essentially taking six months off. But... Uh, I initially went, played a lot of golf, but my wife was like, I don't want to see you here at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. You know. And so then I started to go meet with uh, folks and you know, I was advising them. And one of the companies that uh, I first engaged with was Dynasty. And uh, these four guys who worked for me at uh, uh, Healthion, they went off to start this company called Dynasty.com, which was basically an anonymizer website. I thought of like very cool technology, but there was no business model in, in that nuclear winter. I mean, free wasn't cheap enough for people, you know, so and there was no ad revenue, right? And so that's when we pivoted and started an, a company around the world's first SSL VPN, if you will. And so we pioneered that SSL VPN category. And... Uh, and, and these guys are like, hey, will not you come join us and be the CEO of this new entity? And so I kind of quasi co-founded Neoteris and uh, was the CEO of that company. And, and we were off. To the, and fortunately for us, we managed to raise $5 million. Thanks to Jim Clark and the Boxdale Group. Jim Boxdale, who was then the CEO of uh, CEO, a uh, CEO of Netscape, he had started the Boxdale Group. Jim, Peter Curry, Danny Reimer, Quincy Smith, these were the four general partners at uh, the Boxdale Group. And um, Danny joined my board. Danny is another dear, dear friend of mine. He and I would chat like at eight thirty every morning when I'd be dropping off my kids, and we'd just check in. It was just no agenda. He talk about what companies he's looking at. And I talked to him about, you know, it's very important for a CEO to have somebody that they can be vulnerable with. And I had that in Danny. Danny and I were about the same age group. He was a little younger than I was, actually. Um, but we could talk about just about anything. I mean, he was, he's, I remember him calling me and saying, dude, I'm looking at MySQL um, and uh, benchmarks and listing in it, but at a valuation I don't like, what should I do? I'm like, Danny, suck it up. Just invest in the company. Yeah, yeah, good call. <laughs> that, that's a great call. <laughs> because I was like, I knew, because I, I was seeing it from this side, right? I was seeing it start to take off. And so... I was going to say, I love hearing that because I think as a CEO, um, it can be low, it can, it can be lonely and it can be isolating and you don't you know, sometimes you, 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 you can feel like you have no one that you can confide in or bounce ideas off of. Um, 
and my co-founder has um and and, and my you know my Stacy, who's our uh, chief legal, has they've been both incredible sounding boards for when things are tough and just it doesn't have to be just tough. We just talk about anything, um, and having that outlet has been such a blessing um, to one like help kind of like sharpen the idea or just kill ideas that like hey hey like don't you don't need to go down that path or you know and just kind of like that healthy uh, that back and forth um is in, in, incredibly invaluable um and as you know for neo terrorists like you you so you you found it you raised five million now you have the you know you're now still in the nuclear winner what was it like mm-hmm. what was it gave like? up 45 percent of the company Woo. FYI, Woo. 45% of the company. We raised 5 million on 6 million pre. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, That so, is a lot. <laughs> that was the time. Those were the days. You know, um, I mean, look, I'll tell you, fundraising was very hard. But if you manage to raise money, cash was king. In that climate. Because now funding had evaporated, much like what's happened more recently here. You know, if you look at uh, venture capital dollars invested over the la- second half of last year and better part of this year, uh, it's dropped off significantly. And that's what had happened even back in uh, 2001 and 2002. And so we were able to raise money and so we were able to attract uh, and and retain talent and so we had we assembled a terrific team and not just on engineering we were able to attract some of the best sales guys too but the the big thing was we discovered product market fit at the end of the day nothing else matters and we discovered product market fit, and then it became a thing of beauty. You know, I joke about, you know, standing by the uh, fax machine for the PEOs to start rolling in. Figuratively speaking, that's kind of what happened with uh, Neotels. We went from strength to strength. And um, no, we built it. I, I, I'm proud of the business we built there. And we eventually... Uh, got bought by NetScreen Technologies. We got approached by four companies. We got bought by NetScreen. And I was particular about uh, if we were going to get bought, I wanted to sell to someone I could uh, trade one currency for another. Because And NetScreen was just relatively recent uh, a public company. And uh, I felt like there was more upside to their currency. And I was right, because NetScreen got bought by Juniper within three months of the transaction. And, uh, you know, we owned all by, through our transaction, substantial piece of NetScreen. And, you know, they bought it for 4 billion. So that made up some for that 45% dilution <laughs> that we gave in the first round. Yeah, yeah, you made, you played some catch up for sure, but it didn't take long. I mean, so we we double dipped a bit there. Yeah, that's that sounds re- like a really quick turnaround too. Three months. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, we from the time we started the company to liquidity was less than three years, less than three years, and we were probably the first company that got bought for a substantial amount of money at that time. You know, and. Uh, the venture capital industry woke up and took notice like, dang, what just happened? But we're back. So, so 2003, 2004 is when things started to pick up again. And that's, that's incredible because I think, you know, everyone is probably asking themselves right now, when is it going to become normal again? Or, you know, quote unquote, normal. And, you know, obviously that kind of, would you say that it's just, it just takes one blockbuster IPO, one major like major M and A event to kind of warm things up, or is it something that kind of like takes it takes some time 
for for the IPO markets and mergers and acquisitions to kind of like get us out of the the you know the trenches or the the bottom of what we're feeling right now. I'd say right now what we are going through right now is for a long period of time for almost three decades, John. We enjoyed a period of very cheap capital, right? So, I mean, right from Alan Greenspan's days, interest rates were ridiculously low. And we were basically printing money, left, right, center, right? In fact, uh, that's how we were paying our interest on the debt, right? And, you know, if you think about the current debt of what is it, 33 trillion or something like that. And I think it was the first time in recent past that we actually reduced the debt to touch by about 1.3 trillion or something like that. But we were basically printing money. And we had all sorts of events happen during that period of time. 2008, we had the financial crisis. So what did we do? Print more money. 2020, we had COVID. What do we do? Print more money. Uh, we had more recently uh, the infrastructure bills and the CHIPS Act and this and that. And everything is requiring us to basically pump capital into the economy. And when you do that, that capital takes a certain amount of time to make its way and make its way out of the economy too. That's basically what we're going through right now. Because with that amount of cheap capital, that movie was going to end. And it ended and interest rates started to creep up. And some of that interest rate hike was actually healthy. You know, we couldn't go on for this long without interest rates going up some because how do you pay for the retirees and the 401ks that they're sitting on? You know, they'd have to take, put that money into risky asset classes. And so some of this is actually healthy for the economy in the grand scheme of things. Of course, we don't want to get it to, uh, the interest rates to go up like they did back in the 70s, right? But somewhere in the, four to 7% range is not bad at all. And it becomes the new normal. And once people start to adjust to that new normal, we will start to see a revival of that again. And so I think we're already starting to see some signs of the economy in better shape. In fact, honestly, I don't think we even went into a recession. Yeah. It doesn't like look like a book definition of a recession. It's kind of a weird. <laughs> yeah, it feels weird. It does it it's it's more of a psychological recession than an actual recession. So if you look at it, you know, from a jobless rate point of view, the tech industry has been impacted some by downsizing of various companies, because as I mentioned, I think the tech sector probably got hammered the most. But we're starting to see some IPOs like Instacart went public. And that's a good sign that the IPO window is opening. I wouldn't say it's all the way uh, thrown open, wide open, but it's opening. And that's a good sign. I do think though, uh, those valuation multiples are going to be a lot more modest than they've been historically. But coming back to the jobless rate thing, if you look at the other industries outside of tech, they've actually done very well. And so we've added actually jobs. If you will look at it purely from a jobless rate point of view, uh, and GDP growth point of view, by that classical definition of recession, we're, we'd never entered a recession. So that's what I mean. That's it. I think by all accounts and having spoken to some smart people in this area, 
we feel, everyone thinks that the middle of next year is when we'll start to see a return to a more optimistic outlook. Totally. And, you know, this, this is the kind of dovetails nicely into, you know, we're talking a, a little bit about, you know, the economy coming back and like when the capital flows are going to like kind of normalize a little bit. And I know after Juniper Networks, you, you know, you ultimately made a kind of a pivot, a personal pivot into venture capital um, and, and became a general partner at NEA. Um, how, like, when did you know at, you know, after having been an operator and a manager and an engineer that you wanted to kind of shift your focus to something like venture capital? I didn't accident. So what happened was in 2000 and middle of 2005, the then CEO at Juniper Network, Scott Krins, came to me and he said, uh, uh, these are the words I remember. We were sitting in my driveway. We'd just come back from Vegas and uh, we'd gone there for a sales kickoff. And he said, Kitu, you are pepper to my salt. And he said, I'd like for you to succeed me as CEO of Juniper. He actually mentioned that he had talked to the board about me and he wanted to groom me to be his successor. And I was like shocked when I heard that. And then we talked about, you know, timelines and this and that. And then I remember taking my wife out for a drive to broach this topic with her. And she said, what you did healthy on WebMD because we wanted to get to some level of financial independence. You did Neo Terrace because it was your first time being CEO of a company. What are you doing this for? And I honestly didn't have a good answer for it. I was like a kick in the stomach. When she said, you know, when are we going to become a priority? Your son is in middle school now and you're the math science guy in the family. And so I thought long and hard about, about it. And news, I said, I went back to Scott and I said, I can't do it. Wow. That must have been a hard conversation. It was hard and easy at the same time. It was he was very disappointed. Didn't talk to me for a certain period of time. Kind of ghosted me. But uh, they also lent a great deal of clarity to me as to what was important to me. And so I was the Section 16 officer of the company. And so Juniper put out a press release saying that I was leaving. And that's when I got approached by bunch of venture firms. But I think I spoke to about four or five venture firms. And initially, I had this massive imposter syndrome. I'm like, why me? Like, why would anyone think that I could do this job? And I'd also heard that, you know, you won't know if you're going to be good at this for five, 10 years. I'm like, I don't have that much time. I mean, I know what I'm good at. Like, I, my thinking was okay. I live Juniper. I go, you know, start something and go take over be CEO or something else. You know, that was kind of my mindset because I was very marketable as that at that time, as you can imagine. In fact, I also remember Nir Zook at Palo Alto Networks and Ashim Chandra then at Palo Alto. They came to me and said, "Why don't you come be CEO of Palo Alto Networks?" And again, my infinite wisdom, I was like. I don't want to work for another security company. I was jaded by security. Like, oh, you're doing another firewall. Like, why was I wrong? But, but you know, I have no regrets about that. And, and I'm sure they don't have any regrets either. <laughs> they found some great, uh, great leaders. But uh, that was uh, when I got approached. And then I, I said, okay, let me do this. Let me interview a whole bunch of people. And let me understand this business. And I remember talking to 
General Potter's various firms. Actually, one guy I spoke to is like phenomenal. Uh, this is a guy called John Quinn. He's retired right now, but uh, he probably has forgotten more about venture capital than I will ever know. And he was great. He uh, he really educated me on the business. Uh, my partners at NEA, uh, Dick Ramlick, Peter Morris, Peter Barris, Scott, Forrest, uh, all these guys were I mean, Mark Perry was a class act. Um, these are all folks that I learned a lot from at Chuck Newhall, another legend. So these are all folks that I learned a lot from. And that's when I was like, okay, you know, uh, I have a rubric of what it takes to be successful in venture capital. That's probably a topic for another uh, podcast. But um, I assembled that based on those conversations. And then when I evaluated myself against that rubric, I'm like, okay, I think I have a chance at being successful at this, a better than even chance at being successful at this. And I said, okay, it gives me a learning opportunity. And uh, here I am. You know, the two things that have always been very important to me in my career, John, one has been authenticity. That is, you know, being authentic is really important. What you see should be what you get, right? I don't, do, I, I don't pretend to be somebody I'm not. The sec second thing that's very important to me is intellectual curiosity. So I, we talked about being a student for life. So that's something that um, I've always been. I'm all constantly learning. It may not have anything professional. You know, I taught myself how to be a decent photographer. Uh, I taught myself golf because with some help, I uh, I taught myself poker. I sing. Um, I taught myself how to be a good audio engineer. Uh, good, not great. Uh, my son is even way better than I am. But these are the sorts of things like, you know, there are these mini pursuits. Once I latch onto something, I'll go try to teach myself. So that's that's what this job also affords me the opportunity. And I want to go in so many different directions. And and just to, to go back, like you're it's you mentioned you're getting interviews with multiple firms. What made you choose NEA specifically? Good question. NEA was an investor in both Healthion as well as Neoteris. They were also an investor actually in Silicon Graphics and they were an investor in Juniper. So I worked at four companies that were funded by NEA and there were a lot of ex-Silicon Graphics folks that were part of the NEA investment team. Mark Perry was our CFO, Forrest Basket was our CTO, uh, Dick Ramlick was on the board at both SGI as well as Healthion. Uh, Dick and Scott Sandel were involved with Neoterrace. Scott was on my board, but Dick was the original GP that we reached out to. So I had a lot of connections into NEA and it just felt, you know, very organic. Felt like, okay, I would fit in. They know me. And I knew them. And I felt I could just be myself. That's why I chose any. That's amazing. And it, it, that I didn't realize that they were there. They were present at kind of almost every step of the way. Um, that's incredible. That's all for this episode of the Biotech Startups podcast. We hope you enjoyed our discussion with Kitu Kalori. To learn more about his journey, tune in to part three of our conversation. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave us a review and share it with your friends. 
Thanks for listening. We look forward to having you join us again on the Biotech Startups podcast for part three of Kitu's story. The Biotech Startups podcast is produced by Exceda. Don't want to miss an episode? Search for the Biotech Startups podcast wherever you get your podcasts and click subscribe. Exceda provides research labs with equipment leases on founder-friendly terms to support paths to exceptional outcomes. To learn more, visit our website, www.excedr.com. On behalf of the team here at Exceda, thanks for listening. The Biotech Startups podcast provides general insights into the life science sector through the experiences of its guests. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from the podcast is at the user's own risk. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not the views of Exceda or sponsors. No reference to any product, service or company in the podcast is an endorsement by Exceda or its guests.